Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today's lecture is again going to be on how I made some of the simulations you find on my channel and this time I'm going to talk about simulations of interacting particle systems. So these are simulations I started doing a bit later than when I started simulating billiards and the wave equation, but it turned out that uh, this is a really good source for interesting illustrations of physical phenomena. And it's also probably the most complex piece of code I have written, not so much because the basic algorithm is complicated, it is quite simple, but just because there are so many different things that can play a role in these simulations. So let us start by looking at a few examples. And the first one, that is actually the very first simulation I, I published on these interacting particles. So here we have, I think, about 700 particles. As you see, they repel each other. And they are also repelled by the boundary of a rectangular box, which is slightly larger than the region that you see on the screen here. The color of the particles depends on their kinetic energy, so the red particles are faster than the blue ones. And in this simulation I also used friction, so I gave the particles random initial positions and velocities, and due to friction the velocity slowly decreases. And the interesting thing here is that you see the particles want to go on a triangular lattice because it's the configuration with the closest packing. But due to the boundaries, they are not able to go on a perfect triangular lattice. And that is why we see these defects forming here that originate in the corners and form these kind of triangular regions. So these boundaries are called grain boundaries, and they are actually very important in solid state physics because on one hand they can make crystal less uh, solid, but also uh, it can make, for instance, metals ductile. So it's thanks to these grain boundaries that we are able to deform many metals. Now, the next simulation I'm showing here that was actually suggested by a viewer. It's a simulation where the particles are all put in a box. And in addition, there's gravity and gravity is increasing during the simulation. So you see that the particles, again, try to form a closed pack configuration, but you have these nice avalanches that occur whenever particles are able to find a more close-packed state. And again, you see that there are these grain boundaries that are due to uh, the square boundary conditions there. Now here is a quite a bit more complex simulation I did later on, which is a comparison of two different types of rockets. So on the one hand, I simulated chemical reactions inside the, the two different rockets. So you see that the red and blue particles uh, react to form green particles, and it's an exothermic chemical reaction. So uh, the particles accelerate and then they are expelled from the rocket and creating thrust by the principle of action-reaction. But also the two rockets have different nozzle shapes and the blue rocket had a bell-shaped nozzle and that gives better thrust due to the fact that particles that hit the nozzle are deflected downwards and give some extra vertical impulse to the rocket. All right, so now let's look at how to describe such a system. So let's assume we have n interacting particles, and in 
by simulations n can be a few hundreds, it can be up to a few thousand particles. And the basic governing law is Newton's equation. So Newton's equation for particle i simply says that mi, that's the mass of particle i, times its acceleration, and x here is a two-dimensional vector, is equal to the total force acting on particle i, and this force has several sources. So the first source here is the sum of all forces from other particles. So Fji is the force of particle j on particle i. And I usually take it as being minus the gradient of some potential, depending on the difference of positions. And the potential I usually take is the so-called Lennard-Jones potential, which has the following form. So there's a term that goes like 1 over the distance to the power 12, and another one like the inverse sixth power. And epsilon and sigma are two parameters of the potential. So here you see a picture of this potential. So it is strongly increasing at zero, then it is de decreasing, and it has a minimum a bit to the right of the value sigma, and, and then it uh, increases and approaches zero for infinite distance. And if you take minus the gradient of this potential, you find a radial force with two terms, and one over distance to the power 13, one over distance to the power 7, and at short distances the first term dominates and gives this strong repulsion, and at large distances the second term dominates and gives a weak attraction, but that decays rather quickly. And uh, this potential has been introduced by John Leonard Jones for physical reasons, so it models some complicated uh, quantum processes. And I use it for simulations because it is extremely stable. You could use other potentials, but if, of course, if you use a Coulomb potential, which is attractive, then your particles will tend to collapse all to one point. So that is very hard to simulate without a collapse. And on the other hand, if uh, we take a potential that is repulsive everywhere, well, if you put the particles in a box, it has a chance of not exploding, so you might get something more or less stable. But it is, in general, more difficult to get. So that was the force of the other particles. Now let's look at the force from the obstacles, so the second term here. So this I usually take as one-sided harmonic, meaning that if di is the distance of the particle to the obstacle or to the boundary, uh, if di is larger than d0, there is no force, and d0 is some constant distance, which is comparable to the radius of the particle. But if it's smaller, it increases linearly in this difference, and kappa I usually take very large, like 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 10, something like that. And the force is perpendicular to the surface of the obstacle. Then one may want to add a friction term, a viscous damping term, that goes like minus a constant times the velocity. So you don't always want to do that, but the thing is that if you don't put any friction, then the simulation again has uh, more chances of becoming unstable. So then due to round-off errors in numerical integration, you can get particles that start flying all over the place. So usually it's better to put at least a little bit of friction. And a final, exam a final force is, as we've seen in one of the examples, is a gravity. So for instance, g being a constant vector, and uh, you multiply it by the mass. So this is the equation we want to simulate. Now, how do we do that? Well, 
Let me take a simple example, which is the harmonic oscillator, let's say in dimension one. And so K is the swing constant, M is the mass. I can always assume that K over M is equal to one just by rescaling time. And this one usually likes to write as a system of two ordinary differential equations of first order. X dot is the velocity and uh, V dot is the acceleration, that's minus X. And you can represent solutions in uh, the so-called phase space. And uh, actually a solution will rotate at constant speed on a circle in the XV space. Now, the simplest numerical scheme that you can use for that is the so-called Euler scheme. So it means that we take a small time interval delta t, which I'm going to write epsilon here, and you approximate the derivative by x of t plus delta t minus x of t divided by delta t. And if you solve for x, so xn will be the position at time n times delta t, you get this recurrence relation. So xn plus 1 is xn plus epsilon times vn and something similar for the velocity. However, that is in general not a very good scheme to use in this case. So here I have given an example with a rather large epsilon. So epsilon is something like 0.5 here. And you see what happens is that we always move on tangents to the circle. And because of that, we will actually keep going away from the circle. So my trajectory will look something like a spiral. And even if epsilon is very small, there will always be this drift to larger energies. And another thing that is related to that is that this is a linear map and you can look at the coefficients of x and v, so 1 epsilon minus epsilon 1, and look at the determinant of that, and that is 1 plus epsilon squared, and that is how areas evolve in time. So it means that if I take, for instance, the disk here inside the circle, its image will be an ellipse of larger area, 1 plus epsilon squared, times the original area. So for these reasons, it's better to use other schemes for the equation. And uh, one very nice scheme to know is the so-called Verlet scheme. So the only difference between Verlet and, and Euler is that instead of using Vn in the equation for Xn plus 1, I use Vn plus 1. And you'll see it's even quite nice because it means we don't have to do parallel updates. So we update in series first the velocity and then the position. Of course, I can replace Vn plus 1 by uh, v epsilon, uh, so by Vn minus epsilon xn, I get this relation between xn plus 1 and Vn plus 1. And if you do that, well, what you find is that even though the trajectory does not remain exactly on the circle, it kind of oscillates around the circle. And the smaller epsilon, of course, the closer you will be to the circle. And that is also related to the fact that if now I take the coefficients of x and v here, I get this matrix here, and it has determinant 1, implying that my map is area preserving. So now the image of the circle will be some ellipse, but it will have the same area as the circle. Now, in the literature, you often find uh, a different formulation of the Verlet scheme, which is the following. So this you can check that xn plus 1 can be written in terms of xn and xn minus 1. And actually, what you recognize here is the discretization of the second derivative that is in the equation here but it's equivalent to what I have given here. Now, here I did it for the harmonic oscillator, but you can do exactly the same if you replace this minus x by a more general function of x. It's really uh, 
easy to adapt the scheme to general Fs. All right, so that is one way of uh, simulating the differential equation. Now let me talk about the hash grid. So the hash grid you use because you want to do simulations with many particles. And as we've seen in the example, it can be several hundred or even several thousand particles. And the problem is that when you compute the force of other particles on a given particle, well, there are n minus 1 terms to compute if there are n particles, but then you have to do it for all n particles. So the number of interactions you have to compute grows like n squared. And so if you multiply the number of particles by 10, you will multiply the computation time by 100. And that grows very quickly and it's not practical for most systems. So what I did here is uh, I put every particle in a cell of a certain grid, which I call a hash grid. So every particle here is in one and only one cell of this grid. And then what you do is, if you, we look at the wet particle here, it will actually only interact with the particles which are in the same cell or in one of the eight neighboring cells. And this reduces the amount of computation significantly because for any particle, the number of other particles it interacts with is approximately the same. So it is more uh, complexity of order n, or maybe it goes a little bit faster than n, but it's much slower than n squared. And to implement that, uh, you do the following thing. So first you define at the beginning of, uh, of your, your code uh, a function that sets up a hash grid structure, which means that actually you, you number the cells of your hash grid and each cell knows what are the numbers of its neighbors and how many neighbors it has. And then during the simulation at each step, you update the particle cell correspondence. And that means that each particle knows in which cell it is. And each cell knows how many particles it contains and how and what are the numbers of these particles. And that way you can afterwards compute the force on each particle. And depending on the boundary conditions you use, you have to be careful on how you compute the distances between particles. So sometimes I use periodic boundary conditions, meaning that the cell up here will be a neighbor to the cell down here, and then the distance between this particle and that particle has to be computed accordingly. Now, how do you use, how do you choose the size of this hash grid? Well, this I did a bit by trial and error. Now, of course, you will make uh, an error in simulation. So if you want to use these simulations for physical predictions, you have to be a bit careful. But the, the idea is that since the Leonard-Jones potential decreases quite quickly, uh, as soon as particles are far away from uh, the particular particle you consider, the error you make should be quite small. And then, of course, the more cells you take, the faster your computation will be because there are fewer interactions to compute. But you shouldn't make the cells too small because then what can happen is that a particle is moving at a certain speed and from one time step to the next, it suddenly enters a cell and uh, let's say the red particle here wasn't aware of the existence of the particle and suddenly it's very close. So that can again cause numerical instability. So what you need is that the 
the mean uh, distance that a particle travels during one time step should be much closer than the size of the cells. Now, by trial and error, I found that in most cases, if the average number of particles per cell is something between three and five, uh, things work quite well. Okay, now another thing I use quite a lot is called a thermostat. So here is another simulation where now we control the temperature of the particle. So we started with a rather large temperature and now we decrease the temperature and you see again this phenomenon of crystal formation of condensation but there are quite a lot of defects. So you see all these regions, these grain boundaries and there are many grains here. And now in this simulation what we do is that we do what is called annealing in metallurgy. So we increase the temperature again but not as much as it was in the beginning. And okay now you see that the particles can move again but now we start decreasing the temperature again. And so they will reform a crystal and the hope is that the crystal will be a bit better organized. It will have fewer grains and uh, fewer boundaries. So, okay, you see here again the grains and the boundaries. Now the temperature is minimal. Now we increase it again, but a little bit less. And you see again at some point the grains start moving, the boundaries start reorganizing themselves. But now we are going to increase the temperature less. So now it starts decreasing again. And you see that now as the temperature becomes low again we have a smaller number of defects and this can go on for a while so if i move a little bit further you see that here after one more cycle we have mostly two large boundaries and a, a few defects in here and in the end we get to something with the three main grains and two boundaries. All right, so how do you do this? So one thing to understand about a thermostat is that, in fact, it, uh, it is not a simulation of only a system co consisting in molecules, it is a system that is interacting with some heat bath. So it's a model you use frequently in statistical physics where you, see, where you say that the particles you simulate form a small system and this small system is in, in contact with some heat bath, so it could be a large number of other particles or some, uh, some fields maybe and they regulate the energy distribution in the small system. So actually statistical physics tells us that the energy distribution of the small system should be a Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. And this is what you enforce in this uh, way by using a thermostat and there are different types of thermostat available. So the one I use is uh, called Nose Hoover Langevin thermostat. So here are the equations and down here there's a reference I used for that. So it may look a bit complicated but uh, let us pass this set of formulas. So here the Pn and Qn are the vectors of all momenta and positions at time step n. And if you look at the, the two first and the two last steps, it's actually quite similar to the Verlet scheme. So here I have an update of first velocities, 
then positions with the new velocities, exactly as in Verlet. And at the very end, I do uh, another update and uh, I change the, the order. But it's apart from that, it's exactly the, the same steps. And the three steps in the middle here, those are the thermostat steps. So there are two symmetric steps here which introduce some dissipation. And Xi here is the thermostat variable. And its evolution here that is more complicated is a discretization of a stochastic differential equation. And the main terms are this one. So this one actually wants to, uh, so it computes the total kinetic energy. And then it wants to make it close to a constant that depends on beta. So beta is the inverse temperature. And in addition, there's some noise here. So W is, uh, so at each time you have an independent standard normal random variable. So that is the noise term. And mu and sigma are two parameters. So mu controls how stiff the thermostat is. So how quickly the system reacts to uh, temperature changes and sigma uh, controls the randomness. Now, the equation in the middle here is actually, you have a Xi n plus 1 on the right hand side, but since it's a linear equation, you can actually easily solve this for Xi n plus 1. So, so this is this uh, thermostat algorithm. Now, let me also briefly talk about the initial state I take in the simulation. So. Typically, I use either particles on a regular triangular lattice. If I want to model something like very close to a crystal, and then I give them in general a zero speed. Or I have them located on a Poisson disk process, which is a random process with the constraint that there is a minimal distance between particles. And this is actually important also in relation with the thermostat. So usually this thermostat works quite well, but there's one case that occasionally happens, that is when particles get extremely close to each other, then the force between them is large, and so they, want, they do accelerate a lot, but then the thermostat wants to control the, the average speed. So if some particles are very fast, it will slow down all the other particles and you get these uh, strange non-physical effects. So this is why it's important to have a minimal distance between particles at the beginning. Now, I also occasionally add particles at regular time intervals for instance, to have an effect like uh, snow falling or adding particles to uh, a system of particles diffusing through a maze, for instance. And then it's also important that when you create new particles to avoid adding a particle too close to other particles. So when I do that, I put a test. So I generate a random point where I want to create the particle, but then I only add the particle if there are no other particles in a small neighborhood of that point. Now let's talk about other possible interactions than just the Leonard-Jones interaction. So here's an example where the particles have spins. So they have an orientation and in this simulation the color depends on the orientation of the particles. And there's an interaction between orientations that tends to align particles. So you see that you form these large domains with the similar orientations. But here you see there are two defects, two topological defects. For instance, down here, the green, orange, and red particle really don't agree about their orientation. And here we do again some temperature cycling. So well, you see when the temperature increases, particles can arrange in a more regular grid. But still, there are these two 
singularities that remain. But we will see that actually in the end this singularity down here will be able to propagate to the boundary. So we still have, if you look at the blue, green and uh, orange, red particle, they have very different orientations. But now the temperature is increasing again, allowing particles to move a bit more. And now very slowly we are going to see how the defect here moves to the boundary. So one defect has disappeared, but the other one is still there. Now, here's another example, which is a non-isotropic interaction with a five-fold symmetry. So this I originally introduced because I was kind of hoping that uh, particles would organize themselves on some quasi-crystal that I, I did not manage to do. But still, the dynamics is quite nice, I, I find, because it is more fluid. So it is probably because there are five equilibrium positions in the neighborhood of each particle, and this is at odds with the, with the lattice. So in some regions, particles form a triangular lattice, but it is not quite stable, and that is why the material here stays rather fluid. And another thing you see is these nice lattice vibrations here, these kind of shears in the lattice. You can also see uh, defects like a vacancy here propagating, uh, like up here, and so it's quite an interesting state of matter, I think. And yet another example is, I called it liquid crystals. I found this rather by accident. So I was experimenting with different types of non-isotropic interactions and at some point I happened on, on this situation, which is kind of funny, where the particles want to align. So they, but the equilibrium positions you see are a little bit shifted to the left and right of their main symmetry axis. And for some reason it creates these kinds of strange jumps between configurations. So how do you define these interactions? So, well, first of all, every particle has an orientation, an angle, theta i. And then in polar coordinates, the potential, the interaction potential between particles has the following form. So it's proportional to something similar to the Lennard-Jones potential, but there's an additional angle dependent term here. And this a of phi here is of the form a constant a naught plus another constant a1 times cosine m phi. And m depends on the potential. So it's, for instance, one for these dipoles or spins, it's two for this liquid crystal simulation, it's phi for the pentagonal symmetry. So this defines the interaction between particles, between positions, and there's also an interaction between angles, which is an angular coupling proportional to the sine of the same constant m times the difference in orientation. So depending on the sine you put in front of the sine, you will get interactions where people want, where a particle wants to align or where they want to point in opposite directions. There's one other case which is a little bit different, uh, and I do, did a few simulations of that. It's the so-called uh, Witschek model for swarm formation. 
where uh, actually the speed of each particle is coupled to its orientation. So speed and orientation are the same. And there's an alignment dynamics on neighboring particles. Now let's talk a bit about boundary conditions. So here's one example where we have these uh, interacting dipoles. And now the boundary conditions are periodic, meaning that the left and right boundaries are glued together, as are the top and bottom boundaries. So here we are seeing a uh, an artifact from the thermostat, which is called a flying ice cube, which is that sometimes energy is transferred from uh, more oscillatory or rotational degrees of freedom to translational. So that is apparently why sometimes the uh, whole configuration starts uh, translating in some direction, but it's not so important here. And the other thing you see is that particles have aligned and they have arranged on a lattice, but you still see that there are some defects, so-called uh, dislocations in the lattice. So, for instance, here you have one dislocation and another one here. Now, here is another example of boundary condition where we have a Klein bottle. So Klein bottle now means that while the top and bottom boundaries are glued together in the same way as before, the left and right boundaries are glued together but with a twist. So let me go to the second part of the simulation where we uh, actually the color depends on the number of neighbors so we will be able to see defects in a better way. and. Uh, so again here you see uh, some grain boundaries appearing as the temperature has decreased. Now they, the grains move as the temperature increases again. And uh, as before by cycling the temperature we can try to bring the system closer to a ground state. Now there's one main grain boundary here. However, you see the effect of the Klein bottle boundary conditions is that at the left the angle goes down like this and at the right it goes up. And that is because across the left and right boundary the orientation has changed. And so we see that in effect there is a defect here that has been created due to the boundary conditions. Now here is yet another example of boundary conditions which is more complicated. So here if you observe for instance the yellow particle, let's start again, so the yellow particle you see it, it moves down here and it reappears at the top. And now it has moved to the left, it reappears at the right and so on. So what happens here is that each segment of the boundary has been glued to the opposite segment. So the top left segment has been glued to the one here and the one at the top here has been glued to the one at the bottom here and so on. And you can actually show that this is topologically the same as a surface of genus 2 which is like a torus or surface of a donut but with two holes. That is not so easy to imagine, but you can do it. And this was a simulation to illustrate Wallian motion in uh, such a geometry. All right, so here's a list of different uh, boundary conditions I've been using. So starting with uh, simply a box that is reflecting, that is confining. Then we've seen periodic boundary conditions, Klein bottle, which are like periodic but with a twist of the left and right sides. What I've not shown, but I have simulations with that, is the what is called projective plane or boy surface. Here we have twists on both sides. 
And we have seen this example of uh, L-shaped domain with identified opposites, which uh, gives a genus 2 surface. So how do you implement these boundary conditions? Well, the first thing is that when you define your hash grid, you have to define the neighbors of each cell in the hash grid accordingly. So, for instance, for periodic boundary conditions, a cell on the, in the bottom will have neighbors around it, but also at the top of the, of the rectangle. And then, as I already mentioned before, you have to take care of interactions across boundaries. And in particular, if you use these Klein bottle or projective plane boundary conditions, there you want to have a twist, so you also have to do something with the angles across boundaries. And that is just for the graphical representation, so the particles that, that cross the boundary you have to draw several times and possibly with different orientations. Now, let us talk about simulations where I add obstacles. So, I've already talked a little bit about boundary conditions, like a, a square box confining the particles, but there are simulations with more complicated obstacles. So, in my simulations, the obstacles can be circles or segments. And I always use a one-sided harmonic repulsion from these obstacles. And one thing you have to be careful about is when you have concave corners. So, here is an example where I have parts of two segments. and. Uh, so below is the inside of the obstacle and above is the outside where the particles are. So as I said before, you define a certain distance to the boundary of the obstacle. If particles are further away, there is no force from the obstacle. And as soon as they enter this shaded region here or here, they they feel a repulsive force that is perpendicular to the obstacle and it increases quite quickly. So it's given by a large constant times the distance to the boundary of the shaded region. But then you have to be careful with concave corners like this one, because if you don't do anything in the red region here, what can happen is that the particle enters and then it moves to the side, and then suddenly it gets into a region where it is very quickly accelerated. And that can again cause problems, for instance, with the thermostat. So I had to add a radial repulsive force in this little wedge here for every concave corner. So this you can do for fixed obstacles, but then you can also have moving obstacles. So the difference is that now each segment or circle has a position and uh, an orientation and uh, you take tr you, uh, you keep track of all the uh, forces and also all the torques of particles on the on the obstacles, and you use that to write a Newton equation for the obstacle and animate it. So here's an example which actually is a bit unstable. So here I have the, such a dam break simulation where the dam is made of several bricks. But you see that there are, there are these little explosions happening and I actually believe that the problem was that I didn't take care of the concave angles correctly. There was some mistake in the code and this explosion we have just seen is, uh, is due to a particle entering this angle from, uh, from the side. So these moving obstacles are a bit more tricky to code, but uh, you can do it. So here, 
and just seen this other explosion due to a one or several particles that have been sharply accelerated. Now another feature of my simulations is chemical reactions. So here's an example where we have polymerization. So here we have seven different types of polymers starting so in red they have just one particle in the yellow they have two and it goes up to seven particles and okay you see this evolution where there are more and more large particles polymers that are created in principle one could go to larger polymers but i stopped here at the size of seven and probably the most complex reaction I coded is this Brusselator here, which is a model for the so-called belusov zabotinsky equation. So it involves five different types of molecules and with a certain set of reactions. And what is nice here is that you can actually have something very close to a periodic oscillation. So you see that right now we have a lot of green molecules and now we have the yellow molecules that, that uh, become quite numerous and then their number decreases again and so we have this oscillation between mostly green, blue or mostly yellow molecules. So how do we simulate that? Well, here are the main differences uh, with previous uh, simulations. So first of all, particles have types. So obviously we have one type for every type of molecule. And then for, so each particle can react with a list of other particles and uh, it depends on the type of the particle with which types it can react and it can possibly give a new particle uh, of a different type or even several different particles. And so the possibilities are merging. So two or more particles can merge to give a new larger particle. A particle can split. So one larger particle can divide into two smaller particles. I also did some simulation with catalytic merging, meaning that two particles can merge, but only if there is a, another particle of a suitable type, which is the, ca the catalyzer that helps the reaction. And you can also have a transfer reaction where, say, two particles when they collide, transform into two different particles. And all these reactions occur with a given probability if particles of the right type are within a given distance. And that means that at each simulation step, we look at every particle, we look at other particles in a certain within a certain radius and then we apply the different rules here and we say that okay if particle A reacts with particle B and there, my particle has type A there's a B particle nearby then with a certain probability uh, A and B will transform for instance into C. And in some of these reactions like the one we have seen for the, uh, the, the rocket with a chemical inside uh, the kinetic energy has to be adjusted, so increased or decreased, depending on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Now, one word on how to code this. So, I'm uh, coding this in C, but uh, this can obviously be coded in many different languages. So, when I started doing these simulations and also I did this before these particle systems and these mangrove simulations the natural thing to do is to say okay what do I need for 
all my particles, I need the x position and the y position. So you define a, an array with all x positions and with all y positions. But then maybe the particles have different masses and different radii, and then you add new arrays for all these. But then very quickly it becomes impractical. When you modify your code, you want to add something new. For instance, the orientation of the particle, it's a moment of inertia, things like that. And it's actually much better to use something called and see a structure. So here, for instance, is my structure for particles. So a structure is a kind of a composite variable with different fields, which can be anything like doubles and integers and even arrays or pointers. And so my uh, structure called T particle has fields, well, for the location x, y coordinates of the center, the radius of the particle, then its orientation. Then I also have a switch which tells me whether the particle is active or not, and that is useful, for instance, if particles can leave the simulated region, you want to make them inactive so that they don't uh, take part in the evolution anymore. And then uh, it turned out to be useful also for visualization to put fields with energy and mean energy and then anyway to evolve the system you need to keep track of velocities and angular velocity and then you have properties like mass and moment of inertia. But then it turned out to be actually useful to also put a field for the force and torque each particle experiences and so on. So here we have some fields which are related to the hash grid. So this field gives me the hash cell, the number of the cell the particle is in. Uh, here we have fields uh, which tells me how many uh, neighbors the particle has in the hash grid and what are the numbers of these particles. That also turned out to be useful uh, to speed up the computations. And the delta x, delta y here give the relative positions of neighbors in these hash grids. That is, for instance, useful if uh, you want to draw links between neighboring particles and also to compute the interactions. And here are two other examples of structures I use. So for the hash grid, well, each hash grid uh, knows how many uh, particles it contains. It has a table with the numbers of these particles and it knows how many neighbors it has, how many neighboring cells, and what are the numbers of these cells. And here's another example, that's a structure for the segments I use in uh, simulations with obstacles or boundaries. So each segment has, these are the coordinates of the two uh, endpoints of the segment, the midpoint, the normal vector, which is useful to compute the force, and uh, some other uh, quantities related to computing the force. And then there are some switches that tells me if the corner is concave, if uh, all the segments are joined together, because then I can automatically compute the x2, y2 coordinates. Here are the, the angles which uh, appear in these uh, concave corners. Here are a number of variables which I use. Uh, in fact, in, in case I, I have groups of segments which move and I want to keep track of their initial uh, positions, which is useful to uh, when you want to compute whether a particle are inside an obstacle, for instance. All right, so let me end with a couple of examples. So this is one of the more uh, involved simulations I made a while ago of a Carnot cycle. 
So I, here I put my Leonard Jones gas in a, a cylinder, uh, in a piston. And here we have a first phase where we do isothermal compression. So here the temperature is maintained constant by a thermostat and the piston is pushed towards the particles and uh, so the density and the pressure increase. Now the thermostat has been switched off so we have adiabatic compression and now actually the temperature of the gas increases as well. And we can measure the work because we can measure the force of all the particles on the piston and add this up and multiply by the displacement of the piston and we get the work. So now we are in phase three where the, the piston uh, moves back and uh, the temperature is maintained constant by a thermostat. And you see that by now the work has become negative. So it actually means that the gas is performing some work on the piston. So this is the basic mechanism used in certain steam engines. And now we are in the last phase, which is a, a, a adiabatic expansion. So the thermostat has been switched off and the temperature is allowed to decrease. And okay, we don't come back in this simulation exactly to the initial state, but somehow close to it. So it was quite a pleasant surprise that with such a simulation with a Okay, a few hundred particles and Leonard Drone's interaction, you can really observe these properties of a Carnot cycle. And let me end this presentation with a small tribute to Sir John Leonard Jones, who invented this very nice potential. So here it's again a dam break simulation, a bit simpler since the dam just disappears instead of disintegrating into small bricks. And here I have added uh, particles uh, as if it were snowing. And I had some fun with actually choosing the color of the particles in such a way that at the end you see they form a portrait of Sir John Le Leonard Jones. So how did I achieve that? Well, as you can imagine, I actually first did the computation of the particle evolution and I put all the positions into a large file, but it turned out to not be too large. It was a, a few gigabytes. And then I chose the color of the particles depending on their final position and then I rendered the movie, so using the recorded positions, and that part is actually quite fast. And in this way, I got this simulation here, and I did a couple of other examples where an image appears at the end. So that was it for this presentation on how to make these uh, simulations of interacting particles. So. I hope you liked it and it will motivate you to make your own simulations. So thanks again for for visiting, for for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye.